All right, let's get started. So I'm Blaine Matthew, CEO and Managing Director of Clear Strategy Group, helping B2B tech companies ignite revenue growth by joining a clear strategy with an effective go-to-market model. Check us out at clearstrategygroup.com. And we're here today to talk about the good old SWOT analysis, something that I'm sure all of you have seen and experienced and taken part in uh, probably many times. Uh, this has been around a long time since the 1960s, literally. I think I was first introduced to it in, I think, the 1981 edition of this book. This is now the latest edition, so it's, uh, this analysis has been around a long time. And fundamentally, as, as I think you probably all know, it's a tool that allows you to create a list of your internal strengths and weaknesses and your intern external opportunities and threats and then decide what to do with that analysis and it's what it's the what to do that we're going to dive into a little more deeply uh, in this call right now you can create a SWOT analysis for companies obviously which is what we're talking about today but you can do it for entire industries or products or even people so this can be uh, widely applied let's dive in so this is what a SWOT analysis generally looks like you have a simple list, this is a qualitative list of your internal strengths and weaknesses, and then the external opportunities and threats facing your company. The way to create this is, is pretty simple. Uh, first, assemble a team of folks. I don't recommend people create a SWOT analysis by themselves. So create a, you know, assemble a team of folks that know the company, the industry, the market, the product. And then, uh, you know, I recommend sort of a divide and conquer approach. There's lots of ways to, to brainstorm concepts and uh, a couple of them here. Uh, you know, maybe divide the group into two or four subgroups. Each can tackle one of the columns. Uh, then you can com come back together and uh, review the results. Another thing that I really like, a methodology that we use often in our consulting practice, is something called meta planning. If you can uh, jot down that URL or, of course, shoot me an email after and I'll send you a copy of the slides, uh, it links to a document which explains the meta, the meta planning process, something that I found very effective in helping groups of people effectively brainstorm uh, ideas or lists of things. So definitely very applicable to uh, SWOT analyses. Now, to make this a little more real, I've invented a fictitious company called Warbly Co. Warbly, IoT for bakeries. IOT stands for Internet of Things if, you're, uh, if you haven't been paying attention to that market for the last few years. And I've created a positioning statement for them and we're going to use this company as our sample as we go through the rest of the SWOT analysis. The positioning statement for mid-sized bakeries, Warbly is the only bakery service provider that can connect your baking machines to the Internet of Things driving more cost-efficient operations and higher margins. Over 50 leading bakeries use Warbly today. Now, if you recognize the construct of this statement, this is a positioning statement, and it's exactly in the format of the construct that I discussed at our last webinar on how to create effective product and service positioning statements. If you'd like to see the recording of that webinar, also shoot me an email, and I'd be happy to send you a link to the recording. So that's Warbly Co., and we're going to be using Warbly Co. as the example as we work through how to create a SWOT analysis and then actually make strategic decisions based on that analysis. So let's dive in. First of all, we're going to do the internal assessment. And when you're thinking about which factors to consider for the internal assessment, uh, here are some ideas. And this is not an exhaustive list, but you, you, some, this is a good list to have in front of you to, when you're brainstorming. You know, system structure processes, people on the org side, a lot of marketing related elements, demand gen sales. Obviously, finance is important to think about when you're looking, doing an internal analysis. Production, if there is production in your organization, there probably is some form of service support or a supply chain in some case. Of course, R&D. And then finally, the product or service itself, the strengths and weaknesses of the product or service. So using this as a guideline, it should be pretty easy to come up with a list of strengths or weaknesses that uh, fit into one, of the, one or more of these categories. And that's exactly what we have here. So this is for Warbly Co. again, and we've created a list of strengths and weaknesses for this company. On the strength side, they've got a really strong sales org with national coverage. They've got a lot of working capital with a recent raise. Morale is high. They're growing. Uh, the solution is quite easy to use. That's, that's probably pretty important. And they really understand the market well. 
On the other hand, they've got a number of weaknesses that they've identified, right, based on that previous list. They don't really have a demand gen team. They've got sales, but not much in terms of marketing. It takes a long time to implement each uh, each implementation for these uh, for these clients, and they're burning about a million bucks a month. So that that's a concern. Uh, they've got no brand recognition in the bakery space right now, so their sales org has to do a lot of work to get deals done. And finally, although they're growing rapidly, which is good, it means uh, you know their the job descriptions and roles are pretty loose in the company. So these are the list of internal strengths and weaknesses that were identified. Of course, you might identify more. You might have a longer list, uh, but this is what Warbly came up with. Now we have to do the external part of the SWOT, so external opportunities and threats. And uh, similarly, here are some factors or forces that you might consider when you're trying to think through what the external opportunities and threats are facing uh, your organization. They might be economic, social, cultural, demographic, environmental. Obviously, political, governmental, and legal are a very big, important factor these days that a lot of companies are thinking more about than ever before. Uh, technology clearly has for many years now and, and well into the future will have a big impact on industries and, and companies and both uh, as an opportunity and a threat. And then finally, of course, competition. So some categories to think through as you're creating your external analysis. And here's what Warbly did with those categories. So on the opportunity side, uh, natural sugar substitutes are improving in quality, and that's important because people are afraid of, of calories and they're trying to become more health conscious. They brought up this notion of celebrity bakers. You see, you start to see them on TV more and more, but so far they haven't been sponsoring any tech companies or any businesses uh, or investing in any, so maybe that's an opportunity on the marketing side. Right now, this notion of you know, IoT-based service providers connecting bakery machines together so they become more efficient has no actual direct competition. So that's a great opportunity for Warmly right now to take advantage of while it lasts. And also the price of Internet of Things equipment is dropping rapidly. That's, that's great. Increase their margins. And finally, international. Huge opportunity internationally. Nobody's doing anything internationally in this market. So great opportunity to increase the addressable market size for Warbly uh, dramatically. On the threat side, uh, well, bakeries are not fast movers. They're not early adopters, right? They tend to be later adopters of technology. The second one here talks about the large bakery chains are increasingly uh, putting a lot of pressure on the smaller to mid-sized bakeries that Warbly has been targeting. And that's really important as the industry continues to consolidate. Uh, Warbly did just raise $10 million at a decent valuation, but the market is highly changeable. Who knows if they would be able to get another $10 million or what the valuation would be. Gluten-free continues to be a concern for bakeries and bread makers of, of all types, and that relates also to the health consciousness of this new crop of millennials. So again, this is the external opportunities and threats that Warbly came up with. And there's the complete list. This is your standard SWOT analysis. And now in most cases, after creating such an analysis, the team would then say, okay, what do we, what do, we do about this? And a, a discussion would ensue, and maybe some ideas would pop out. The rest of this discussion now is going to be about providing a bit more of a, a structured approach or process to answering that question of, so what do we do with this SWOT analysis? So the first thing we're going to do is something called an IFE matrix, an internal factor evaluation. And what we're basically going to do is take the list of strengths and weaknesses that we had already identified and weight and rate them and create a weighted rating of the relevance and importance. So let's, let's start with the weighting. So the weighting in this case is the relative importance of, this, of each particular factor to being successful in that industry. How important or how relevant is that factor to success in the industry overall? All right. Now, what I've done here is use a weighting system that totals up to, to 1.0 because it makes some of the math a little bit easier at the end. But you could also use a 1 to 4 rating scale. Say 1 means not important, to, not important at all to being successful in, in that industry, and 4 might mean highly important or very relevant to being successful in, the, in that industry. In fact, my, my method you can see of using 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.15, and 0 0.2 
is sort of the same thing as a one to four scale, if, if you think about it. So the actual numbers don't matter that much, but I, I did it this way just uh, as you'll see, it makes the math a little easier in some of the analysis. So basically, in this example, the team you know, got together and in, in Warbley's case, they each wrote down and basically voted on what their ratings were. Then we all came together, brought the scores back together, and then had a discussion and reached a final agreement on, on what the scores were. Now I'm going to have one caution here, and I'll, I'll repeat this at the end. You're going to see, you know, a lot of numbers start to be applied to this methodology. And, and at its core, the SWOT analysis like most strategic planning, is it's a quality it's largely a qualitative methodology. And don't be too concerned or confused by the fact that we're at trying to put some numbers around this. The point of the numbers is just to add a bit of structure and a framework to this analysis, but it's it's not uh, you know, there's no mathematical precision here in this analysis. All right? It's just to provide a bit of structure, a bit of framework, and to be, you know, in the ballpark of, of assessing, look, is this one bigger than that one or not? You I wouldn't fret over should the number be 0.235 versus 0.1769, right? Obviously, that level of, uh, of uh, specificity we're not going to have in this analysis. So we've got the relative weightings, and now we put ratings. And the ratings are specific to Warbly. So on the strengths, you're rating this factor as a minor strength, 0 for Warbly, or 10 would be a major strength. On the weakness side, again, zero would be a minor weakness, and 10 would be a major weakness of Warbly. So you can see uh, on the strength side, strong national coverage is a major strength of Warbly. Uh, you can see on the weakness side, having no demand gen team in place is a major weakness of Warbly. Uh, so the team, again, brainstormed the ratings, agreed on what the numbers were, perhaps by some kind of uh, voting or polling system, whatever you decide to use. And then finally, we're going to take the weighted ratings. You multiply the weights times the ratings, and you get the scores. Now, the weaknesses, I'm taking the negative of the weights times the rating, since the weaknesses are obviously a negative factor. And if we take the, the total strengths minus the weaknesses, we get a score of plus 2.3. Basically, as, as you can, is probably pretty obvious, any score greater than zero is probably a good thing because that would mean the weighted strengths are more important or, or higher than the weighted weaknesses for the company being analyzed. So that's interesting and important. And now we're just going to hold on this for a second. We're going to come back to this analysis when we bring this all together at the end. So now what we're going to do is, is ver a very similar thing for the external factors, called an EFE matrix, external factor evaluation. We're going to do the weights and ratings again. But the, the factors and the weights and ratings are, are, can, are a little bit different, especially the ratings are a little bit different in this case. So the weights are similar, though. We're looking at each of these opportunities and threats, and we're looking at the relative impact of that, of that factor on the industry. So how important is this factor on the industry overall? And again, I used, uh, you know, I used a system that adds up to 1.0, but you could use a one to five scale or zero to four, what, you know, whatever system you want to use uh, for the weights is really totally up to you. And now we've got our ratings. And the ratings are a little bit different than the last one. So the ratings in this case mean from a zero means Warbly's current strategies are ineffective or irrelevant to this factor. And a 10 means Warbly's current strategies are highly effective, that it's, we're doing something right now that definitely, you know, takes advantage of that opportunity or ameliorates that threat, okay, combats that threat. So if you look down the scores, you can see there's a bunch of opportunities and threats that have zeros. There's really nothing Warbly is doing that is even related to this opportunity and threat right now. So that's something to think about. On the other hand, you've got some that are uh, that are highly uh, that where the strategy is highly related. Obviously, on the threat side, this issue with valuations and capital availability is is a threat. But Warbly just raised ten million dollars, so they they you know, we're pretty effective, at least for the medium term, in, uh, in addressing that threat, maybe not so much for the long term. On the opportunity side, you can see the factor of no direct competitors, competitors in the bakery Internet of Things. Well, obviously, that by definition, you know, Warbly's strategy of 
embracing, effectively creating that model uh, means they get a very high score on that one. And you can see some of the other scores there. And as before, we take the weights times the ratings to get the scores. Now, in this case, we're not we're not taking the negative of the threat scores. We're le they're, they're just uh, both positive factors because we're assessing how, remember, how effective our strategy is on a 0 to 10 scale in relation to that factor. So whether it's an opportunity or threat, we're looking at our, stra our strategic effectiveness, and a higher number is better than a lower number. You can see if we tally up the total opportunities and threats, we get a score of 2.9. Now, the average score, if I would have got a 5 or more on every one of those factors, that would have given me a score of 5.0. So you can see at a score of 2.9, we're probably uh, not taking advantage of the opportunities and threats in the market nearly as much as we could be. The fact that five of these numbers are zero, we get a zero rating proves that by definition, that there are many things going on in the market, many opportunities and threats that we're not really doing anything about. All right? Again, hold that. We're going to come back to it. So now we're going to take uh, do something called a TOES matrix. TOES is obviously SWAT spelled backwards. <laughs> and we're going to take the same list of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats and put them in a, you know, put them up against the two by two. And the methodology is pretty simple. We're going by combining strengths and opportunities, weaknesses and opportunities, and, and these various elements together, by combining them together, we're going to brainstorm and come up with a list of possible strategic choices or strategic actions we could take that would uh, leverage these different combinations of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So let's uh, do that. Well, that was quick. So in reality, this is probably, you know, an hour or two of your team brainstorming, breaking into groups, coming up with ideas, maybe using the meta planning method to, uh, to winnow down the list. But this is what the Warbly team came up with. So to give you just a couple of examples, uh, strength SO strategies, combining strengths and opportunities, we took strength one, a strong sales org, with opportunity five, international market and combine those together to say, well, let's focus on international expansion. We've got a team which knows what they're doing. They're already distributed around the U.S. Absolutely could uh, some of the guy on the East Coast take over a European expansion. Uh, you know, we, we think we could. We've got a very strong, knowledgeable sales force, and they're ready to go, and we could theoretically leverage that to take on uh, the international market opportunity. Let's look at another one. Uh, number a weakness and threat opportunity. So weakness one, around having no demand gen team in place, combined with threat two, standalone bakeries under increasing competitive pressure from national chains. Well, that might imply that hey, we don't have a great marketing or demand gen organization. If we're going after a higher volume approach for small and medium sized bakeries, you need demand gen. You need lead generation. You need to have a marketing machine. We don't have that. Since we don't have that, let's just acknowledge that and instead focus our strategy and our product positioning on a very small number of large bakery chains. We can do that with less marketing and, again, more a focus on our strong sales org with, uh, with national coverage. So that's a strategy or strategic choice that pops out of uh, weakness one and threat two. Three other ones very quickly because we're going we're gonna to wrap it up here in a minute. We could create a demand gen program based on all these available celebrity bakers. That's a, a possibility. We could retool our hardware solutions with these lower cost devices that are continually coming into the Internet of Things space. And finally, we could refocus our core positioning on a, an, an easy message really to combat the fact that, uh, you know, these bakers are late adopters, but the solution is actually quite easy to use. And if you think back to our product positioning statement at the beginning, our company positioning, we didn't really talk about that uh, at all. So these are, you know, five choices that came out of this analysis. I think if the team was really spending a bit more time on it, you could easily come up with eight, nine, 10, 15 choices, but I came up with five to make it simple. So what do we do with this? How do we decide which of these choices we can, we should or could move ahead with? Obviously, the, the core element of strategic planning and strategic thinking is you can't do everything simultaneously. You have to choose. And now we're going to use this tool and the factors we considered before to help us choose. So to do that, we're going to use something called the QSPM, the Quantitative Strategic Planning Matrix, and this is going to leverage all the work we've already done already, so it's, it's pretty easy.
So on the left-hand side, you can see we have, again, our list of opportunities, threats, strengths, and weaknesses, all right? And we have the weights that we took that we figured out previously from the IFE and EFE matrices. So we've already, we've already done the weighting, so that's fine. Don't have to do that again. And now the columns across the top are three core strategic choices. Now you might recall there were five choices we had figured out in the previous slide, not three. But what the team agreed on was that choices two and three about creating a demand gen program with celebrity bakers and using lower and leveraging lower cost IoT equipment, we're, we're going to do that anyway. They've decided those are tactics, those, those aren't really strategies. Uh, we, are, we do have a mandate to go and, and continually reduce the cost of the IoT equipment we're embedding inside our clients. That a demand gen one is, is really, really more a demand gen tactic than a strategic choice. So those are not that they're bad. They're good ideas. We're going to keep them as ideas, and at least in terms of number three, things we're going to do anyway. Uh, but that's not a strategic choice. Whereas the three on top focus on international expansion, change the core product positioning, and or refocus exclusively on large bakery chains. Those are important strategic choices, and certainly you probably couldn't do number one and number five at the same time. Absolutely. You know, maybe you could do number four in conjunction with number one and number five, but number one and number five are absolutely exclusive. And so we're going to use this QSPM to help us figure out which of these choices we should focus on as an organization first. And to do that, we're going to apply an attractiveness score to each of these three columns. All right. Now, to each of the factors in each of the three columns. Now, an attractiveness score is from a minus five to plus five scale. Minus five is that strategy, that particular strategy would actually have a negative effect on that opportunity, threat, strength, or weakness, all right? So if you look at that strength or weakness or opportunity and threat, and you implemented that particular strategy, the result would, would be likely quite negative if you chose minus five, zero if the strategy was neutral, or plus five if the strategy would actually very much take advantage of that opportunity, threat, strength, or weakness. So we're going to go through and again using your team brainstorming, everybody's writing down their numbers, their votes, there's lots of ways to do it, but your team is going to come up with attractiveness scores relative to each one of these strategies for each of these factors. So let's see the result of that analysis. So that's exactly what we did here. We went and put in the attractiveness scores on a minus five to plus five scale for three of those strategic choices that we have. Now we're not gonna dive into uh, this in a lot of detail, but just to highlight a few things. So you can see the focus on international expansion strategy. Obviously, you know, it's highly attractive relative to the fact that opportunity five is international market is totally underpenetrated. So we, we gave that one uh, a very high score. Uh, on the weakness side though, we can see we have no demand gen team in place, even in North America. There are long implementation times for each client, which would make expansion into another, you know, a whole another domain, uh, you know, lengthy and, and problematic. So there's some pretty high negatives in this one as well. If you look on focus on the it's easy in core positioning, you get a few uh, higher scores there. That would obviously is obviously related to bakeries being slow to adopt new technologies, uh, and it obviously leverages the fact that the solution is relatively easy for non-technical people. But overall, you know, not not a lot of uh, some decent scores, attractiveness scores for the repositioning of the product. Finally, on the strategic choice of focusing sales exclusively on large bakery chains, you can see uh, some of the positive factors here relate to, you know, since bakeries are slow to adopt new technology, well, large bakery chains actually probably do have, in fact, they, they do absolutely have more IT support, more, in, more technical and infrastructure support. They're used to running their organizations like a, like a machine. Uh, it also leverages, obviously, the fact that these that standalone small and mid-sized bakeries are under a lot of pressure from these large bakers. So you can see there's some good positive scores there. So obviously, we calculate the weighted attractiveness score, add them all up, and you can see how our three strategic choices uh, ended up. International expansion got 1.1. 
focus refocusing the positioning on an easy message got 2.3 and uh, refocusing the go to market on large bakery chains got a 4.9 you know by far the highest score so by this analysis we should be doing number 5 that's that's probably the obvious thing to do now i want to caution a, a little bit here what what i would do with this analysis is use this as input now to have a larger discussion with not only the team that created it but across the organization board members and others right to to consider there are lots of factors lots of considerations that you probably didn't look at when you're doing this analysis so you know the, the fact that number five came up with the highest score doesn't mean you must do number five but I think it should at least serve as a pretty good strong proof point that you should look at that one give it another look and uh, and strongly consider it whereas maybe international expansion probably maybe save that one for a little bit later a couple of tips before we wrap up so as I said before although this looks like a table with lots of numbers and it's very scientific and precise and exact don't don't sweat the numbers okay the ones that were really observant probably even saw a couple of little errors in my previous spreadsheet there I just uh, put those in just to see if you were paying attention but don't you know this is not really about the numbers it's about applying a bit of process and structure to a qualitative strategic framework you know when you're creating this stuff you're brainstorming so open up to all possibilities involve people that haven't all drunk the Kool-Aid that haven't all uh, that aren't all insiders and in fact you I highly re recommend you use a facilitator not only bringing outsider thought process but as you can see the process of running this is you know it's, there's a lot of steps a lot of processes and if you have your lead strategic thinker running this process they're not going to be able to contribute to the result and that wouldn't be very good so use a facilitator that's it uh, before we open it up to questions uh, I just want to let you know we've got another webinar on Thursday Feb 16th at 1 30 p.m. on a framework for go-to-market models it'll be really interesting unlike our first couple of webinars this will be the first webinar we do which actually ha has sign-ups and registrations and reminder emails and all the good stuff is going to be in place you can sign up for that webinar as well as future webinars at the URL you see there clearstrategygroup.clickmeeting dot com I do have a cool strategic alignment survey so you can see how aligned your team is around your core strategy and product positioning relative to other companies in the benchmark survey it's totally anonymous takes 90 seconds highly appreciate uh, you taking a, a few seconds right now to take that survey and you will see the results immediately and I use the results of that survey in future webinars reach out to me at any point in time Blaine at clearstrategygroup.com or give me a call I'll send you a copy of the slides and uh, and I hope you learned something today about how to take your SWOT analysis to the next level. Now I'm going to stop the recording and we will open it up for any questions.